So how many of you were woken up about 5 o'clock this morning to a horrific storm? Yeah? yeah? My dogs freaked out. You know, I have this very large Great Pyrenees, and he was trying to duck under my bed that doesn't have a space for that. And I thought, man, oh, man, I said, I'm going to bring the devil into town, and look what happened at 5 a.m. So we're going to have an opportunity to explore what does that mean in unity terms. What does that mean in unity terms? I don't know what that outer peripheral thing was, but if there was ever a call from the beyond, they were chattering. I thought, what a great setup for the devil made me do it. I was looking at the origins of Lent simply because I haven't been in a custom denomination church in 35 years. So I thought, what exactly, like where did that come from? Where did Lent come from? And we know that the Southern Baptists don't recognize it. They say, as a matter of fact, it doesn't exist. It's just what those Catholic folks made up. And the Catholics say, well, you know, we see it in the Bible. We see it in Matthew 4, 1 through 11. I thought, well, let's get right down to it. Let's just see what that says. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. And Jesus said, It is written, One does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So if we ever have doubt that our words have power, there you go, right there. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put your Lord, your God to the test. And the devil once again, for the third time, took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdom of the world. And he said, all this I will give to you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil disappears. And I thought, all right, let's unpack that because we don't talk a lot about the devil in unity. What does that mean? First of all, (laughs) I told Gabriel Nelson this morning, when I was getting dressed, it had to be a little theatrical. It had to be the color that most of us associate with the devil. What color might that be? So how many have been in the corporate world and you wear a very dark suit and a red tie? Ooh, does that give you another version of power? And then Gabriel Nelson said, well, I wanted to play this little game. And I thought I'd come out in a blue dress. The devil wears a blue dress. I thought, well, that would have been interesting. Stay tuned. You never know with this group. In the oldest known translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, the word ha-Satan, a Hebrew word found in Job and Zechariah, is translated by the Greek word diabolos, the same word in that Greek New Testament that stands for the word devil. It meant slanderer. So again, I looked at our words. When we speak against someone, When we don't speak a truth, is that not slander? So the devil may not have been dressed in red with a little pitchfork and and horns, but spoke against its own divine nature. So I wanted to look a little deeper because everything is symbolic in the metaphysical world. So let's look at 40 days and 40 nights. Biblically, it's a time of transformation. It means you're going to go through some sort of a trial. It means that you're going to go through some sort of a process that opens up the door for you to transform from one way of being to a new way of being. And they mentioned Noah and the flood. Wasn't that 
40 days and 40 nights. They mentioned Moses crossing the desert to the promised land. I think it took him a while longer. Wasn't it 40 years? 40 years? So let's look at the number 40. Spiritually interpreted, four represents unlimited freedom of action. Unlimited freedom of action. And zero is unlimited capacity of action. This number is used when a definite time frame cannot be given. So let's look at day and night. This represents periods of understanding and periods of lack of understanding. So when you get a new concept, when somebody introduces you to something new, do you look at it and say, well, I can, I can buy that. No, that's really not jiving with what I believe. And you go back and forth, day and night. The wilderness symbolizes spiritual challenges and how we do our very best to navigate this journey in this lifetime. It's about the journey. It's not about that end destination. It's how we react to what happens in this life path. And then there's the devil. So what does unity say about the devil? And here I was thinking, the Last Supper. Imagine, you're one of the 12, the chosen disciples, his best friends. And he calls you together and everybody's done the Passover, like this is standard practice once a year. But this particular night, he says, find me a room that just the 12 of us can be together. And more than likely, you would not have been seated at a table that really wasn't 2,000 years ago. You probably would have been on a handmade woven blanket. There probably would have been one dish in the middle. And you would have had bread to soak up whatever was inside that dish. And you probably shared one goblet. So you are this magnificent 12 with your master teacher, the one that you've been following for three years across the desert. And you're a little excited because it's the Passover. And at the Passover, you're going to see friends and relatives that you don't see all year long. And then some of you have been watching. Some of the crowds really like Jesus and what he has to say. And some of the crowd has been plotting for his death. You have been in those crowds where he's had to whisk away quickly. And so now you're a little anxious. You're a little fearful. You want to see family and friends. You want to do the religious holiday. You're a good Jew, remember. However, there's some fear that surrounds this. Jesus has that bowl in front of him. And if you remember the story, he says, So watch the one who dips their bread after me. Who is that one? Judas. Now, there's a lot of thoughts about Judas as the betrayer, but if Jesus is the Son of God, if we are all the daughters and Son of God, and God is omnipotent, omniscient, always present, all knowing, then Jesus knew his mission. Does it matter what Judas did or did not do? And some people say that Judas was such a zealot. He was excited for the new kingdom. And this Jesus was supposed to make it happen on earth. And it wouldn't happen fast enough. So if he tipped off those Romans and they came and took him away, surely he'd bring the big angels down and they would conquer the Romans. That was a thought. He's just pushing the timeline faster. There is no timeline in spirit. There is no hierarchy in spirit. But Judas was doing the very thing that he had been called to do. So you get to look at it again. The divine plan is in place. Satan entered into him, said John of Judas, a belief of old times that still finds credence among certain sects of today. Is that many of men's misdeeds are not essentially of their own doing, but an outside entity a discarnate and evil personality. It has gotten into them and given them a compulsion to commit evil deeds. And the evildoer would disclaim his deed by saying, the devil made me do it. 
no self-responsibility. But what we know today is that goes against our divine nature. Ernest Wilson, in The Week That Changed the World, says, There is nothing wrong about the earth as such, but man is not essentially an earth creature. We are only transiently so. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. So we're not going to hang out forever. We're temporarily here having this sometimes magnificent experience. But the very earth and the things of the earth can seem so very powerful and very real to us if we allow ourselves to become involved with them, very real and very insistent in their decisions. I would suggest at this point in most of our lives, we have our own moral compass. Your parents instilled in you whatever they did as your teachers, as maybe some of your religious teachers. But by this time, we know what is right and wrong for us. We already have that inner structure. And when we act outside of our own values and beliefs, that is what unity calls the devil. We are not being true to ourselves when we allow something outside of us to influence us in such a way that we act against our innate divine nature. Now, for some of us, it's that gut. When you've done something wrong in your eyes, you know it. You know it. You take it in. Have you ever had that acid, fiery acid boiling up inside? Because you were out of alignment with your own integrity. People who have splitting headaches, the part where it just pounds and pounds and pounds. You're thinking, oh, could I have done that differently? Could I have done that or said that differently? Because whatever I did, I didn't really mean to hurt somebody, or maybe I did. Then you get to deal with that. And then it stays with you. You're the one who loses sleep over it. Somebody wise said to us this past week, if you are hysterical, it is probably historical. If you are hysterical, it is probably historical. Meaning from ages 1 to 10. So if you've ever been the individual so blessed to be blasted by somebody, and you're like, whoa, where did that come from? It probably had very little to do with you. It is something that has been burning up inside of them and you created that trust path that you could hold whatever demons were going to fly and it's a whole different way to look at it. Because whenever that busts forward and you feel like you are being attacked and you're over there going, I don't know what I did, you probably didn't do anything. But somewhere... In that cognizance, they said, you can take it. Maybe even unconsciously. So when you flip the table, turn the other cheek, instead of you now being the victim of somebody espousing their demons at you, you can say, wow, this is a sacred moment. Because nothing you can do is going to change where they are unless you're able to hold that space in compassion. They may just fire off and fire off and fire off. And you have the right, the healthy right, to call healthy boundaries. There is a time and a place when you can say, heard you, that's it, we're done. Go on your merry way. And sometimes that includes hanging up a phone call. You have the right to call healthy boundaries. I'm just going to let you off the hook that when people are coming at you, it may have very little to do with you. You just were a catalyst for change. And they have the opportunity to look at that and say, now I'm ready. Now I'm ready. Or not. And you're not attached to it. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Let that fiery hell burnest, furnace, let it go. It's not your stuff. 
it's theirs. But be very, very aware that when you do the spouting, you are also responsible for it. So Ellen Debenport says, the devil symbolizes human thoughts adverse to divine good. Jesus' temptation, that whole story we just read in the Bible, was about his ego and his will. The struggle between his ego and his will. Now Ellen goes into this little story, I had to look it up because I don't remember this. There was a time the Samaritans, which was anybody outside of the Jewish movement, we chose not to receive Jesus coming through one of the towns. And his two disciples, James, we call wisdom, and John, we call love. They're often referred to as the sons of thunder. And so they come to this little Samaritan town, and the Samaritans don't want Jesus there. So John and James are feeling very protective, and they say to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from the heaven and we'll just incinerate them? Those are your guys. That's your tribe. They got your back. <laughs> now Jesus looks at them and he says, Gentlemen, remember who you are. Remember whose you are. For you are of the divine. Therefore, let that go. Don't take that on. I'm not. I'm unattached to someone else's fire. Instead, let that passion that burns within you be one for good, for love, for seeing things that make a difference. Be the change maker in the world. Be the change maker in the world. So we fast forward a little bit. And Jesus comes at the Passover dinner to his friends. And he has a basin of water. And in that basin of water, he says, let me be so humble. Let me let go of my ego. Let me bathe your feet. Now, who do you first one, who do you think, we talk about him frequently, the very first one who says, nope, not me, Lord. It's Peter. Peter who represents faith. Oh my God, we love Peter. We're helping Peter through the whole Gospels get some faith. <laughs> so Peter says, no, no, Lord, never will I let you bathe my feet. And Jesus said, so if you will not let me bathe your feet, then you are not coming with me in the kingdom. Because I am not above you nor below you. And then Peter says, do you know what Peter does now? Well, Lord, bathe my head, bathe my hands, bathe my feet. Just give me a bath. Well, that's not exactly what he said, but it's kind of. <laughs> so I, watching the cameras, they like to leave the podium, not me. <laughs> so we're Shabnam. We are going to come down through the aisles. And even if it's a little uncomfortable, you extroverts, I love you, hear me. We are letting go of our ego today. That's what this whole talk is about. And if you've got the little limp booklet, follow it along because it's really cool. So I want, as we come down the aisles, pass your little handy wipes. Don't open them yet. Don't be like those kids in the Christmas candy. If you'll start handing those out, just hand bunch on the aisles and they'll pass them down. If you're seated by someone you know, I'd like you to sit by someone you don't know. Now, I'm not going to spend 30 minutes doing this. What I want you to do is face the person next to you. That means you two are married. You got to split up. <laughs> so sit by someone you don't know as well. I want you to open the little package. And if your friend can't open by themselves, help them. And I want you to hold the wet nap in your hand. Don't run away, introverts. Quickly, quickly. We only have till noon. Do we have everybody got one? Do you guys got one? How many do I need? One more. Yes, you each need one. Each of the two needs one. Open up the little package. Pass this down, please. Do you all have yours? Do we, do we have enough? Where are we? Shabnam, where are you? Make sure this whole group gets them. If you don't, you're just going to have to imagine with me.
So everybody look up. Will you, where's Gabriel Nelson? Gabriel Nelson, will you come play with me? <laughs> Give me a little background. <laughs> Don't you just love when your minister does things and they're like, what are we doing? So everybody hold up your nappies. I want you to look at the person next to you. They're going to hold their hands out. I want you to bathe top and bottom of each hand and then switch partners. And I'm going to say these words. Are you playing with me, Gabriel? Take it as a sacred moment. No talking, just listen. Be sacred. Today I let go of my ego. Today I see pure love. Today I wash the hands of God. Today I see you. Try to look at your partner with those beautiful eyes of love. Today we are whole. Today we are free. I release anything unlike love. I see the eyes of God in you. Today we are one. There is no separation. And when you're finished, put your hands together as if we're going to say namaste so I can see you. Look at the person whose hands you just washed. That you just blessed with being exactly who you are. And I invite you to look at them and simply say namaste. And so it is. Amen.